Chang Morris is a certified NLP coach and facilitator. She has worked with numerous executives and management teams, assisting them in becoming clear on their vision and navigating the path to creating long-lasting results. Ms. Chang utilizes her many years of experience in healthcare, currently as the practice manager for Ross Medical Care, a direct paramedic care practice. For her presentation today, she brings 15 years of hospice experience, during which time she has educated countless individuals, families, and groups on advanced care planning. Welcome, Michelle. Good morning. Yeah, hello. I'm going to all this firing. So, um, I'm very happy to be here today. I don't know how many years have I been here since since you began the CBC, yeah. Yeah. five years. So it's good to see familiar faces and new faces. Um, my hospice experience, I love this model because actually it's the model that hospice uses. So if you're not familiar with hospice, um, it is based with an inter interdisciplinary team that meets, and you have a whole team, care coordinators, case managers. And so this is, Right, goes right along with that. So today, let me find my clicker here. Okay. Oh, there we go. We're going to talk advanced care planning and what it is and when is it done. So first of all, if you have an advanced directive in place, I'd like you to stand up. Okay, thank you. So the second thing, the second thing is raise your hand if you think advanced care planning or advanced directives are about saying how you want to die. So for me, it's about how do I want to live? And so that's exactly um, what advanced care planning is. So advanced directives, there's a, there's a lot of different things to advanced directives. First is a health care power of attorney. In Oklahoma, we like to call that a health care proxy. We're going to talk about a living will. The DNR do not resuscitate, and there's uh, another thing going around is the A and D, and it's allowed natural death. So if you, for those of you that I have worked before, we talked about motivation and how people are motivated. So if you recall, typically two ways in which people are motivated are towards positive things and away from negative things. So this is a nice trend that's going on um, because if I'm motivated away from negative things, I'm not going to like the sound of do not resuscitate very much. But I'm going to like the sound of allow my natural death. So do not resuscitate away from negative things, A and D towards positive things. And I've coached before with a lot of you on identifying how people are motivated and then languaging in a way that will motivate them. So this is just an area um, where you can do that if you're having advanced care planning conversations. And the POLST. Um, so this is a physician order for life-sustaining treatment. And so who all is familiar with the POLST at all? There's lots of education. Okay, going around. Okay, perfect. So first, the healthcare power of attorney. Um, so it's a person who can make decisions Healthcare decisions for you. Um, someone who you know shares your values about life and your views about life and medical decisions. It can be a family member, it can be anybody. So, one challenge with advanced directives and having conversations about them are the um, what people believe that they are. And we're going to talk about those a little bit later. Um, it can be anybody you want. If you're really close with the guy at the quick trip and you share the same views and he agrees, he can be your health care proxy. So that's important to know. Um, one is NLP term that where everybody is always motivated is choice is better than no choice. And every human being is wired that way. 
It doesn't matter what it is. Choice is always better than no choice. So one way that you can utilize when you're having advanced care planning conversations is to be around the choice option because everybody will choose choice over no choice every time. Um, and you can, and choice, you can choose how much authority your healthcare proxy has um, in an advanced directive. So a lot of people believe if I give somebody that control, that power, um, then they can just decide whatever they want. And you can actually state only if I'm hooked up to machines can my healthcare proxy make a decision for me. Otherwise, this is what I want done. So um, that's important for people to know. Um, some people are reluctant about um, talking about what they would want. They don't even know what they would want for sure. Um, my mother has COPD and it was five years into her disease process before I had this conversation with her. Um, we had a scare, she went to the hospital and I just said, Mom, you know what, we need, we need to talk about this. And, and what do you want? And she says, I don't know. And I began to go into medical mode and explain some things and, and she was very emotional and tears ran down her face and she said, I don't know about any of that stuff. I don't know what you're saying right now. And I said, well, um, she said, but you know all about it. And I said, well, if you want, you can just allow me to make the decisions if you are not able to. She said, that's what I want. And then that solved that issue. And we began to talk about her values and views and different things like that. So sometimes when we attempt to have advanced care planning conversations, we go straight into, do you want nutrition? Do you not want nutrition? Do you want CPR? Do you not want CPR? Do you want to be innovated? Do you not want to be innovated? And people feel the same way my mother felt. Like, I don't even know what you're saying to me right now. I choose life. That's what they're going to default to every time. Okay? So sometimes, sometimes you just say, is there somebody you know who knows you so well that they know your values, your culture, your spiritual life, that you would trust to make a decision for you if you could not make it for yourself? And if you get a yes, because the key to having a good conversation and getting excellent results is getting a yes. Because once you get the first yes, then you can go very far. This is the most important part when you're having an advanced care planning conversation that gets left out, even in hospice. And I've had lots and lots of these conversations. An advanced care directive only comes into play if you are in danger of dying and you cannot make decisions for yourself. <coughs> now I know that, I've been in hospice for 15 years. Most people do not. You can say that to them and they go, oh, but on a subconscious level, I'm telling you, all they're thinking about <coughs> is, I wanna make my own decisions. I wanna make my own choices. So it has to be communicated especially people not in healthcare, and that's what we must always remember, that as long as you can talk, write, nod your head, and you can make your own decisions, your advanced care direct directive does not come into play. It just doesn't. It's there if you are, cannot make your decisions. That's all it's there for. And that is so important that it does not get educated and it does not get communicated well, even in hospice sometimes. So always remember that. And when you have the conversation, repeat that to people because they will default back to, I'm gonna lose control of my decisions of what I want to do and what I don't wanna do. And I don't even know what that might be. So let's talk about a living will. So, wishes for the end of life care, or as I like to say, how I want to live till I die. Um, and so it's a written document, and are you guys familiar with the advanced directive? There's a copy in your folder, so I wanted you to have it um, so that you can look at it because all these aspects are in the Oklahoma advanced directive. My mother lives in Texas, it's not near as good as our Oklahoma advanced directive. 
um, which is why we had a harder conversation because it's not so comprehensive as Oklahoma is this. So I want you to be familiar with it. Um, and if I, and the living law comes into play again. If I'm permanently unconscious, um, how I want to be treated, this is what I want. And you can say which of the procedures you would want, which ones you wouldn't want, and under what conditions each of your choices applies. You can get as detailed as you want. There's a place to write in there. I didn't want um, my healthcare proxy to be confused about my views. And I even put in there, if the doctor says to you that there is less than a 50% chance that I will wake up or recover of whatever's going on to me, then I want to allow natural death. That's how clear mine is. So if my doctor says there's a 49% chance, my healthcare proxy is very clear. That's not the odds I want. You can get that detail. Most people don't know that. You can also say, no matter what, you do everything. No matter what. You can say that. People think advanced directing, you're like, oh, I need to choose that I'm not going to have this or I'm not going to have this. But you can also say, you do everything until my body is done and there's nothing else you can do. And that's a very important thing to communicate as you go forward with your advanced care directive initiative is it's not about saying how I want to die. It's saying how I want to live. And some people, I've had many conversations, it's been in hospice, you might not think I have it, but I have had many conversations because I had many providers that trusted me to have the hospice conversation with their patient in order to educate. And I've had many conversations where I've educated on hospice, advanced care directives, and someone has looked at me and said, no, thank you. I want to stay alive no matter what, whatever they have to do. And I'm used to having tough conversations and I just ask them. So to be intubated, to be hooked up to a machine, yes ma'am. To perform CPR until your ribs break and uh, all of those things, I get pretty graphic. It's important that people know what kind of decisions they're making. They will be straightened and say yes. And that's their right and that's their choice. And I tell them, okay. Because that is what they want and they have that right to do that. So advanced care planning is, is not about choosing not to have something. It's about choosing what you want based on your values. There's some religions, um, Catholics particularly, that it's against their religion to give up. There's some that that's how they feel with their religion. That you do not give up, it is God's will, that's not for you to do, and suffering is part of this thing that we do here on earth. And that's their belief, and they have a right to that. And so it's important that you know that, that you consider that, and that also we communicate to people, it's not about not choosing things, it's about choosing what you want to communicate. So CPR, ventilator use, artificial nutrition, and comfort care. Always remember what? Only comes into play if you're in danger of dying, you're unconscious, or you cannot make decisions for yourself. It's the only time. Otherwise, it just sits there. Do not resuscitate and allow natural death um, without a DNR or an AND which I'm not sure if one was quite to the end yet, but without the end, healthcare providers are going to do everything they can to make sure your heart beats and that your lungs work. They will hook you up to a machine. They will put a needle through your heart. They will crush your ribs. Be clear about that's what that is. Um, because that is what that is. Don't innovate. You see this more in, in uh, hospitals. Um, so... I know you guys are kind of concentrating on the COPD, CHF, and Alzheimer's with the advanced directives. So we all know if we've been in healthcare for a while, CHF and COPD kind of go hand in hand. If you have COPD long enough, you're going to have CHF probably. If you have CHF long enough, you're, it, it affects the lungs and the hearts. But 
conversations with my mom. If her if her lungs go up, then let her go. She allow natural death. But if it's her heart, get that thing beat. She's clear on that. I'm clear on that as, as her health care proxy at this point. A pulse. Um, so you have, we didn't print it out, but on your drive you have, were there some people from OU Medicine here? So OU uh, Medicine is where I got the post. So are you guys familiar with your post since it's in your medical system? Okay. So it's an excellent example. Um, and what it is, is it provides guidance about your medical preferences in the form of doctor's orders, which is really important in the hospital. Um, and I think one reason that the pulse came about, um, it's cr typically your, you know that you're going and you have to, you want to make sure that your wishes flat out are taken care of. It's typically at the end, critically ill. I don't have a pulse because I'm not there. Um, and it's a medical order. And so the patient sits down with the doctor or the hospitalist, which is the case sometimes, and says, listen, we need to fill out a pulse because I want everybody in, in this hospital to know exactly what I want. It's a form of an order, so it kind of raises it higher. Oh, and an emergency, immediately an emergency. So we all know, I don't know if you know, I know. So in a hospital setting, you have shifts, you have different hospitalists come in, and you have, it, there's constant change. And in a perfect world, all the information gets transferred between shifts. In reality, that doesn't necessarily happen. So a pulse just raises that uh, to where if someone just comes on shift, I did work in a hospital for five years too. If someone just comes on shift and someone codes, it's there quick, they can see it, oh, this is exactly what they want. Instead of, oh, do you know what they wanted? Did you get a report? Da -da 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 -da. There's no time for that. Okay. Organ and tissue donation. Who knew organ and tissue donation was part of the advanced care directive? Good. And so it's an important part. It doesn't get talked about a lot, um, but I have seen where um, we've had patients in hospice and they wanted to be organ donors, and um, but it wasn't talked about. The family wasn't aware, and then. Something happens and they say, hey, so is your mom an organ donor? And the family's just, they don't know what to do right in a crisis situation. So um, anybody, any age can donate organs, typically heart, lungs, pancreas, kidneys, corneas, liver, and skin can actually be donated. Um, and then at the, at the time of death, sometimes they're asked and, and people don't. And also, if someone has a DNR in place, so if my DNR is in place, but I'm an organ donor and I am passionate about organ donation, then a conversation has to happen about, okay, I, I want to allow a natural death, but if I need to be hooked up to a machine so that somebody can get my heart or my skin or my liver, that's kind of doubtful, to be honest. But in case, um, then okay, you can do that. You can do that in order to harvest my organs so that somebody else can utilize them. So let's talk about the Alzheimer's di diagnosis. So with COB COPD, CHF, you know, in my experience in hospice, you have a little time to have this conversation. You have a, a little time to have a timeline about it, their advanced care planning. Um, hardly ever in my experience, does someone get COPD and then, you know, six months later, unless they're not having good population health care management. <laughs> um, so it's really important with Alzheimer's, when there's an Alzheimer's diagnosis, um, that once it happens, that the conversation begins to happen. Then, there's, there's not time to wait, as with other things. Um, also, financial and estate management is really important, um, not just the care management, but the financial aspect as well. Um, we have seen, I have seen in hospice where these things <coughs> are done, and it is important 
um, to their health management because if finances, if a living trust isn't put in place, if somebody isn't control of their finances, it can adversely affect their health. It can affect them getting groceries, their rent being paid, all of those things, and, it's, and it is a very important thing to talk about. And so you have the will, you have a financial power of attorney, which is different than the healthcare power of attorney, and that's important to know. I've had families where one person was the financial power of attorney and one person was the healthcare power of attorney. So two different people. And so that coordination is fun whenever you're coordinating that. But be aware that that happens and I think it happens more and more. And the living trust, of course, to be so that they can get what they need. Um, advanced care directives to be considered with Alzheimer's um, is that Alzheimer's is tough because it can go and the decline is um, gradual as far as going and then um, at the end. But a lot of healthcare things can happen before the Alzheimer's disease progress act, uh, actually is the cause for the end of life. So um, conversation or things that have come up on hospice and conversations to have is, okay, so you have Alzheimer's and let's talk about your advanced care planning. Um, what, what if, you know, your Alzheimer's is taking effect and, and you're just, what if you need a blood transfusion? What if you need dialysis? What if you have a different disease process come up? Because those are hard conversations and we've had them in hospice many times to where we've had a patient on hospice for Alzheimer's and another disease comes up. And the, and the families have to decide, are we gonna treat this? Are we gonna treat this cancer? Are we gonna treat this considering the Alzheimer's? And of course the patient at that point cannot make decisions and the healthcare proxy makes it. but. Um, it can be talked about before that disease progression gets to that point so that that patient that has Alzheimer's can make that choice. So those are some important things with Alzheimer's disease, but you, you, you have to have that conversation. So when everybody stood up um, on who had advanced directives, I think we were right about at 29%, maybe a little bit less. Um, of people who had a living will. Um, and that's a very low number because if you ask people what they want, just in general, um, they can tell you about 60 something percent of the population can tell you what they want, but they don't have it officially anywhere. Um, so it's seen, it's seen as limiting care. So we talked about that a little bit. So it's like, oh, I'm saying I don't want this and I don't want this and I don't want this. So with the, um, was it the Lewins model, um, it talked about dispelling rumors. So if you want to change something, then you, the second step was dispel rumors. It's not about limiting care. It's about maybe even saying, I want all the care you can muster up for me. Um, give it all to me. It's about choice. Um, some people think you need a lawyer or they got to pay money in order to have it, different things like that. And so that's out there. Um, we kind of get immune to, to the, that challenge because it's in our face all day, every day. But a lot of people don't know it's simply printing off a piece of paper getting it done. Um, access to advanced directive. Um, no experience versus common experience. I have an awesome advanced directive, but I've been in hospice for 15 years. So I have lots of experience with advanced directives. So if I ask you all um, what flavor of ice cream would you like, you can probably tell me because you've had ice cream many, many times and you know what you like and you know what you want. Um, so having absolutely no experience with end of life or medical, my mom felt like she could not make a decision on that because she had no experience with it. Not like she's had this disease before or even that she knows how, where it's going to go. So um, remember that when you're having the conversation. Don't get lost in your experience and what you know. Don't um, be a peer because of what you know. Um, you know, 
it's not about compulsion, it's about compassion. So have that compassion and remember. Um, it's not uncommon for doctors and hospitals to disagree with family members. It's not written down. That can be an issue and people need to know that. Um, it's not uncommon for family members to not agree. And I have some good stories about um, <laughs> family members at the end of life care. Um, because everybody has different values. So it's important to have it written down. Um, hospital doctors will err on the side of sustaining life um, every time. So if you don't write it down, that's what they're going to do. And it's because, there's a good reason for that, there's not very many lawsuits. Doctors don't get sued for giving too much care in the hospital. They don't. They do get sued for not giving enough care. So it's not a bad thing, it's a natural thing for them to be like, to sustain life because, for that reason. Also because to be good doctors, you kind of have to be about sustaining life, you know? That's what I tell people. Okay, so let's talk about some solutions to these challenges. So um, an advanced directive is a very private matter. Um, as a case manager and what you all do, um, you know, this can be a challenge. In hospice, I'm meeting with people one-on-one, -on -one, um, in their home, very comfortable place for them, discussing a private matter. That's a lot easier than what you guys are faced with when talking about advanced directives, okay? Um, some solutions would be a web-based advanced directive with an app on the phone. Um, so I found one, actually, while I was researching. It's called mydirectives.com. It's amazing. I haven't finished it. I started mine, and they just sent me a reminder to get on there and finish it, which I love. Um, so it's not even just this black and white. It even says, if I can't speak and you take care of me, this is the kind of music I like, and don't play this kind of music. I love that. <laughs> If I can't speak and you take care of me, this is the God I pray to. Please don't pray to your God. This is the day. And so it goes so in depth um, that, that it makes it more personal. It makes it more personal. Does it ask all of these questions that's in our advanced health care directive? Absolutely. It has the black and white, but it also has those things that make it personal. This is how I want to live. If I can't talk to you, if I can't tell you something, this is how I want to live. Not how I want to die. This is how I want to live. Um, so I love it. I hope it advances there. Um, it, it's qualified for the Blue Button Initiative. I'm not real familiar with that, but whenever I kind of went ADD on it when I was preparing <coughs> my talk, um, it's going to happen going to happen to Blue Button at some point. So education, so that's the key, right? Education is always the key um, when it comes to doing these things. So with advanced care planning, you're not going to make a call and complete advanced care planning the first time you call someone or the first time you educate on advanced care planning. It's not going to happen. It's the reason why people can come onto hospice and not have a DNR or any advanced care planning. Because people realized that is an education and that is a process. If you require that at the beginning, they're not going to be able to use that resource if they want to. So you don't have to. So write that down. If, you're, if you didn't know that, someone does not have to agree to have a DNR. They do not have to agree to any of that in order to get hospital services. So plan a seat. So when you do your pre-call planning, pre-visit planning, which I know is very important to you, plan, just plan a seat. So if you, if something happened and you couldn't talk anymore, and you couldn't write, you couldn't communicate in any way, um, who knows what you would want? And so in that question, I never used advanced care planning. But I was asking it about, about advanced care planning. So be conscious of your language. Be curious. Ask a question that makes them think for a minute. Well, I don't know. All right, well, I'm just putting that out there so you can think about it. 
on to whatever your next thing is. And then that, when you call them again, so I'm wondering if you thought about what I asked about last time. So it's really important with advanced care planning that you plant the seed and make them think for a minute. Make them be sitting waiting in grocery line and go, oh, I'm going to Google this. I don't know about this. I'm going to Google it because we're Google Meisters. Facts tell stories sell, as Dr. Gallus said. You can get facts, 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 facts. You're telling people thing about facts. If you want to sell it, tell a story. It does it every time. And so people are like, well, how do you do that? There's lots of ways you can tell people stories about other people and it plants the seed. Oh, and it, did you, oh, I was, I'm sorry, I was distracted for a minute. I saw on the news where um, a family's having to make a hard decision because a patient didn't have advanced care planning. I mean, spend a little time with it. But you tell stories and it makes them think, hmm, because you're not making it personal to them. But we all, when we hear stories, subconsciously make it personal to us, automatically. It's a, it's a subconscious thing. Choice is better than no choice. When you use your languaging, when you talk to people about advanced care planning, including yourself, it's about choice. That's all it's about. It's not about all the things people make it up to be. It's about choice and everybody knowing what my choice is and standing in that. Motivation towards and away from. What do you not want? What do you want? So if, if you're saying, what do you, do you not want, and you're not getting the response you want, then start saying, what do you want? How do you want to live at the end? And so those are some ways that can be helpful. When? When you're considerably healthy is when you should start your advanced care planning. And from my understanding, that's kind of how we're trying to go, right? Let's do it earlier. Because you have a clear head, you can have conversations without everybody getting upset. I was 40 when I did my first advanced directive. And this is very sad in our culture, but all my friends thought I had cancer. <laughs> and they were whispering behind my back, does Michelle have cancer? Brittany was said, did she book a trip to Paris? No, she probably didn't have cancer. And so they're having this whole conversation. I'm like, no, I just want people to know what I want in case I can't talk. And they all said, we don't even know if there'll ever be a day that you can't talk. <laughs> Link it to something, right? So we hear talk about mammogram, um, for men, the, the prostate, the colonoscopy. Link it in your system. If you want a system, Oh, so it's time for you to have your mammogram and also to think about advanced care planning while you're healthy for down the road. So that's how you do it. For down the road, let's go ahead and plan. Let's, let's start having that conversation. Let's send you to education. Let's send you to this website. Hey, check out this website. You can check it out and do it because people will do it in their own home. That is a great way to get people to take a look and do it. Um, so link it. Link it to something that people already do. For me, 40 minutes since I had to get my mammogram. My doctor's telling me, listen, we're going to have to check out some of your parts because they're going to start wearing out pretty soon. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to do some advanced care planning. And then every 10 years. So if you set up, hey, when you're 40, and then do it every 10 years, just set it in place. That's been 10 years. Is it updated? Instead of asking people, do you have advanced care directive, ask them, have you updated your advanced care directive? Because then you're presupposing that they have one. And then if they don't have one, they go, oh no, I'm behind. I need to update it, I don't even have one. And you get a sense of urgency pretty quickly. On a subconscious level, it works, try it. Marriage, divorce, de um, death in the family, my healthcare proxy goes, I'm probably gonna need it. Diagnosed with a serious illness, diagnosed with a chronic illness, Diagnosed with a terminal illness. So my plan, I'm updating it every 10 years. Unless one of these things happen, then I'm going to go in there and update it again. And that's it.